somebody. John, hit your, John. Bellinger. You just hit your button. I'm custom. I know. His family's going to talk. Thank you. Yep. He didn't tell me he wasn't. Okay, I didn't hear from him either. Well, we, I phoned the mayor before too. He's not an alder. Joey can't get anything by you. Yeah, he Man. No. He thinks he's Dale Carlson. I don't know. All right, I will call this uh, meeting to order. If we could uh, call the roll, please. Bellinger. Here. Bitter. Here. Warren. Here. Strawn. Carlson. Here. Damro. Here. Donahue. Here. Hammond. Here. Heideman. Here. Herman. Here. Jose. Unexcused. Kaff. Excused. Lassard. Excused. Thiel. Here. Uh, Vanderweel, excused. Wolf is unexcused. Okay, we do have a quorum. Alrighty, if you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the um, minutes from March 10th, 2015 um, are presented. I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye, motion passes. All right, we're gonna move on to the public forum. Um, just keep in mind, as with uh, common council meetings, the public forum needs to be um, on agenda items only, and we're gonna do a time limit of three minutes. Um, do I have anyone here for public forum? Mr. Peters. If you could just state your name and your address, please. Jason Peters, 1225 Kaufman Avenue. Can I start? Let's wait. Okay, go ahead. You'll have three minutes. All right, I'm going to go as fast as I can because I thought I had five, but... Uh, good evening. My name is Jason Peters, and I've been a resident of the city of Sheboygan for the last 16 years. I read on Sunday that Alderman Bellinger would like people to come with solutions to the wheel tax, and I applaud him for that. I feel lately the morale of the citizens who live in Sheboygan is down, and instead of just complaining, we have a common council members who are offering to listen to the people they work for. So tonight, I bring you some solutions to the wheel tax. Number one. Sell the former Boston store property as soon as possible. The taxpayers have already spent over $800,000 in buying and de demolishing the former Boston store. It is time to sell it and use that money to put towards our streets. Your summertime music festival was nice, but at this time we cannot afford to keep this prime real estate as a free extra parcel 
for the Kohler Arts Center. If they want it, they should buy it or put it up for sale to another private entity. Number two, sell the Money Pit Marina. For a place that only has 268 boat slips and in the last two years the taxpayers have spent over 500000 in fixing the docks, it is time to sell this. If no private firm wants to take it over, then it is obviously not making a decent profit that needs to be shut down. Number three, eliminate the city administrative position, which will save over $120,000 a year. Nothing personal to the current administrator, but this position was made during the issues that came up with the former mayor. Either our current mayor has some sort of issues, which I don't believe, so in this case, we do not need a city administrator, administrator with a city this size. Doing these three things will bring over $1.4 million to fixing the streets. It's not enough to cover the entire $4 million, but a better start than your wheel tax, and it will give you enough time to maybe work with the county and looking at charging a county-wide wheel tax for an amount a lot lower than $20. Or how about a 0.25% or 0.1% county sales tax? Brown County had a 0.5% tax. I truly believe tourists should help pay for the streets that they use. If you go to Blue Harbor during the summer, 80% of that parking lot is full of Illinois plates. They should help pay for the streets that they're damaging. I understand the importance of tourism, but I also understand the importance of representing the people who live in Sheboygan. With the extension of the garbage tax, and now this future wheel tax, enough is enough, and it's time to start cutting on your end. Let's reverse the recent trend of having Sheboygan be a great place to visit and a terrible tax gouging place to live. Thank you. Do we have anybody else here for public forum? Alrighty. Uh, moving on to um, 2.1. Um, it's an RC by three, uh, RC number 354-14 by 15 by Committee of the Whole. By all the person down here adopting an official mission, uh, mission and vision, vision statement and core values. Um, and based on our agenda tonight, I placed it under matters to be held, so I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right, I have a motion and second to hold this over until our next meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. All right, moving on to 3.1. General Ordinance number 4-15-16 by Alderperson Berg, June 1st, 2015. An ordinance creating section 2-138 of the Municipal Code entitled Remote Attendance at Meeting so as to permit and regulate participation in meetings by telephone, video conference, or other means. Now this uh, document was um, referred to us from a prior alder person. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be doing anything with it. Uh, with it. Do I, is there any discussion on this? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Ma uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For discussion purposes only. Uh, well, been, I'm sitting in a seat, so. It's been that kind of a day. <laughs> Anybody that attended finance knows. Um, I, for discussion, I would uh, move to approve. Second. All right. I have a motion and second to approve. And under discussion? Um, I would like to get uh, Attorney Adams, um, got your name right this time, Attorney Adams' opinion um, and um, you know, the legal ramifications of this. I know from reading the document that you, if you attend remotely, you can't be part of the quorum, but what are the other ramifications? Can they vote? What about closed session? So on and so forth. Is it the chair's discretion whether they allow for um, remote access? Because otherwise you could have an entire committee remotely. Um, I just want to get your feedback. Right. You well, have, you wouldn't have a quorum. You can't have an entire committee appear remotely because, and this is, it's in our ordinance, but it's also state statute that you don't count as part of the quorum if you're not there physically present. So you wouldn't be able to just suddenly outsource, you know, council meetings and committee meetings to your homes. Um, as far as the um, uh, the chair or the mayor's um, Ability basically, a member is entitled to participate and vote to the fullest extent possible, but there are a couple of exceptions. Um, members not entitled to participate and vote on any matter that requires the visual assessment of a witness's demeanor. That typically is you're going to be dealing with quasi judicial hearings, those kinds of things. Um, you, you would want people to be physically present. Uh, the other is uh, on any matter that requires the visual assessment of physical evidence or exhibits. Again, that's primarily going to be quasi-judicial hearings. However, to some extent, that would be at, you know, there are 
occasionally circumstances where you may have to pass a document around that's not available and, and that could conceivably be a problem that would not allow a person uh, to then uh, participate or vote on those matters. Another issue to deal with is you have to have the proper equipment. You know, is it possible to do? Um, most likely it's going to be possible to do with, with things like Skype. The technology is, is, is uh, pretty much there. You also have to um, uh, provide some notice uh, at, when we know that somebody's going to appear remotely. Uh, there has to be, uh, the meeting agenda has to indicate that. Um, <coughs> so uh, the, uh, generally you're gonna have to provide some advance notice. So this isn't one of these things where you um, call in 10 minutes before a meeting and say, oh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to be there. Um, and, and generally that's what sub E talks about. You're not able to participate in the meeting if the meeting notice failed to state um, that the person would appear by telephone or by conference. The other thing is if the equipment breaks down, you're out of luck. You, you know, you're not gonna be able to uh, appear even though you planned on it. All right. Any follow-up questions? I'm good for now, thank you. Your light was blinking, Marilyn. Um, I think that um, particularly with um, all of the particular exceptions that are built into the uh, ordinance that this is a good idea. I think it moves the council proceedings including uh, the meetings in this chamber as well as committee meetings into the 21st century. I think most of us who sit on, you know, work with other organizations, participation um, remotely is, is sort of a given. Um, I do think there are enough protections here and I really like the idea that it, um, it's nice that I like a state statute. <laughs> but you know, if you, you, you don't count a, a toward the quorum, you need to identify that you're not going to participate uh, in advance. I actually did this. Um, I, was, I didn't participate in, in a vote, um, but I was way far away and um, uh, participated in a salary and grievance meeting uh, via Skype phone. And it really worked very well. Uh, there was, um, at no extra expense to the city, there was uh, conference calling uh, equipment that was available, and I think that we could work on it pretty easily. I think it should be the exception rather than anything that um, happens on a regular basis. We should all try to be here as much as we can. But when the important matters come up or when you know we're traveling and, and participating um, and want to continue to participate, it takes a little getting used to, but I think it's a really good idea, and I think it's something that we should move forward with. All right. Thank you. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for Attorney Adams, I'm just curious, when was the last time that the state statute was amended to ad address the technology? And um, if I may ask a follow-up to uh, Chairman Carlson, if he has um, any inkling of the, any revision to the statute moving forward in the next legislative session to you know, bring the state statute even further up to date with technology that's available. I don't know that question off the bat, but I, I, I do know it's not on, I mean, in the state Senate, you can call in remotely and you can vote um, over the phone. So, I mean, there is precedence for it at higher levels of government, especially within the state. The assembly cannot, but the Senate can, but I defer to the other question. Yeah, as far as when the, uh, when the state statute was last changed, I don't know that for sure, but it's been a while. If you look at the statute, it seems to assume telephone participation, but it was written at least with enough forethought that you can talk about video conferencing and that kind of thing. Most of the language for our ordinance, um, frankly, I looked at other communities that are doing this now and looked at their language to see what, what, what they were doing. And some of those are fairly recent, um, even within the last year that they've passed those uh, ordinances. Thank you. Any follow-up? No. All right, Alderman Thier. Feel, feel. I should learn how to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to point out, I think it's a great idea also. Um, this past year I was in training for work for six weeks where I couldn't be here. And I think it would have been a great opportunity. I would have loved to have been here, except I was in Minnesota. Um, I just think it's a great idea to get into the, the technology thing if we can take advantage of it. So I think it's a great idea. All right. Thank you. Do I have any other comments from the floor? I guess I would just add my editorial. I think it's a great idea, and as long as um, it's been mentioned already that it doesn't become the norm because we wouldn't have quorums, but um, I, I think it'd be good, especially there's a lot of us that do travel for, for work, so. Mr. Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess one follow-up, um, 
uh, I think it's a great idea, and I all for technology, as uh, Dave knows. Anything we can do to bring us into the 21st century, I'm all for. Um, I just think we need to make sure that we have the right protocols. So who is ever chairing the meeting? You know, right now we hit a button, and they know we want to talk. When you're on a phone, what do you do? Say, hey, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, right in the middle of somebody else's speech. So we got to make sure we have the protocol set up to be able to deal with that, so it doesn't, you know, get fairly chaotic. We can certainly vote via our iPad as long, or, or Chromebooks for those that are using those, as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection, you can log in and be able to vote. It's just, you know, how do you continue on a, a, a committee meeting or the, a council meeting, you know, with the quorum and making sure everybody gets an opportunity to speak. So that would be my only concern. I'm certainly going to support it, but we need to make sure we have the protocols in place. And if that means updating technology, then we need to update the technology we have. So thank you. Absolutely. Any Mr. Ballinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my question, you know, I may just, Don's comments made me think about it, and I'm not sure, Attorney Adams, if you know the answer to this or not. Would you envision the committees then uh, being conducting their business on board docs and, you know, going and voting via the, uh, the board docs and, and doing it that way then it to could. accommodate this? Yeah, I, I don't know if we're ready to do that. I would defer to IT whether we're actually ready to do that with the committees. Um, I suppose that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is, you know, is you just simply have, you know, if you've got teleconferencing Skype, you should be able to at least give the high sign to the chair that you want to speak. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, one of the ideas behind getting the Chromebooks was to eventually use them in committee meetings, especially in a voting capacity. I, I just think we haven't gotten there yet. I think it just involves training the whoever's clerking the committee um, to teach them how to use the the setup. And is that correct? I'm deferring to our IT director here. Pretty much a lot of our standing committees are already on board docs for, as you see them posted for minutes, you know, for agendas and such, that, you know, if they bring their Chromebooks or devices to the meetings, we could vote. It could be brought in, but a lot of the times we don't because there's only a couple agenda items, so it's quicker to do the manual method, but it could be done. And then if, if the few conference rooms that we do have, if they're not already outfitted with um, speakerphone capacity and or video, we, we could do that relatively on the cheap? Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Heideman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, not that I'm against technology or anything, <laughs> and uh, I don't have dinosaurs in my neighborhood, but really? I guess if, if I was running for public office, and I went to my neighbors and I said, and you know what? I'm not going to be at that meeting. I, they can contact me. I'll be out of town. I, don't show, I think there's still those, those individuals or uh, constituents and citizens of Sheboygan that want to see us at the meetings. That's why we run. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, again, technology is great. I don't think it's, uh, and again, I've missed my meetings too, but I make every effort <clears throat> because I hold a public office to be at the meetings I'm supposed to be at and not having to, to make sure that it might not coincide with my schedule, but I still want to represent my constituents, I think it's more important for us to be there to see what's happening and, and to show our constituents that we will attend the meetings, physically attend the meetings. So. Absolutely, and I, I wouldn't disagree with you, and that's why I, it's been stated numerous times that this wouldn't become the norm, nor could it. And obviously, as you know, uh, once you're elected, it's a two-year term here, so things change sometimes, such as uh, Alderman Thiel got a promotion and he had to leave for six weeks. So, I mean, things happen. It's not going to be the norm, and it, and it shouldn't be. I mean, that's going to be the expectation of this body uh, and the leadership here to make sure that people are actually attending. Um, so, I, But thank you for your comments, absolutely. Alderman Hammond? Um, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't want to monopolize this conversation, and I certainly understand what all the person is saying, but I think it gives us an opportunity to better represent our constituents because if you are traveling for six weeks or um, a week and you can't make a meeting, you can dial in and you can still be engaged and be part of the conversation. I guess one question, um, uh, Attorney Adams, that I'm not sure we got is calling in remotely, does that have any effect on closed sessions? Um, given the fact that there's no way of guaranteeing the 
that there's not someone else around and the, and the right. you know, privy of closed session. I, I would say that. that the best practice would be to not have people participating and voting in closed sessions when, when they're, uh, you know, participating electronically. So they would have to disconnect at closed session. Okay, thank you. And, and this is a question for our IT director once again, not to put you in the spot. Um, w w with the type of software that is used to call in. Um, um, usually there's an 800 number associated, a, pa a PIN and a password. There's ways to know who's on the call and who's not, and can you kick people off the call? Just, I mean, can you double check that someone's not sitting on during closed session, just in case that is a concern for people? There is software like WebEx or GoToMeeting. If you use something like that to join a meeting, you can see who all the participants are. So if somebody's not on there, then the administrator of the meeting can disconnect them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other discussion from the floor? I would just say, if this does happen, if you're on the phone, just make sure it's on mute when you're not talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't elaborate. Um, any other discussion from the floor? All right, I do have a motion and a second to approve. Um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Do we have to do a roll call on this? You're only in committee, so you would not have to. Okay. It's, it's just getting referred to council. Just trying to speed things up, Alderman Hammond. <laughs> Any opposed? Opposed. All right, uh, chair votes aye, motion passes. <coughs> All righty, 3.2, general ordinance number 12-15-16 by Alderperson Bellinger. An ordinance amending various sections of chapter two of the city of Sheboygan Municipal Code to provide for the direct referral of communications, resolutions, and ordinances to committees and eliminate the requirement of a second reading except where otherwise required by law. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm gonna <coughs> ask uh, Attorney Adams to chime in here too and um, further give some history and background of, of uh, the ordinance the way it is right now and the intent to uh, go with direct referral. Uh, when I first became an alderman, um, I, I was just kind of curious why we needed to have um, two readings and why everything, you know, a lot of things, most everything has to lay over for a second reading uh, before it went directly to committee. And um, I just thought that that was um, a, a state ordinance or, or that was the way things went. But uh, in looking into it further, um, in talking with Attorney Adams, uh, that's not necessarily the case. We don't have to do things that way. And the only reason I want to look at this is to um, uh, expedite things and um, not necessarily um, or not at all try to uh, hide anything from the public. That's, that's not my intent. Uh, in talking with Mr. Adams or Attorney Adams earlier today, uh, if, if there were direct referrals, an alderman would submit uh, um, a request and uh, the city clerk would send it directly to the committee. Uh, it wouldn't show up on the um, next agenda for the Common Council, uh, but in talking with Attorney Adams, he thought that there should be some type of report that would be generated by the city clerk that would show the items that were direct referred so the public <coughs> would have notice and, and know what's in committee right now before it comes back out of committee. And certainly anything that comes out of any standing committee um, is going to be back on the, on the agenda too. So the intent is to uh, speed things up a little bit. Sometimes this body moves at a glacial pace and, and I would like to just see things move a little quicker at, at, at some times and um, that's the intent. And I would ask Attorney Adams to kind of chime in and give a little background history on in what you were able to find out when you looked further into the ordinance? Sure, um, th there are a few things that must be dealt with in the traditional way, and those are in um, subsection um, B uh, on page the second page of the ordinance there, and, and it has to do with primarily levying taxes, appropriating money, budgetary type things. Those are the things that you suspend the rules for now occasionally, um, uh, but those things do require first and a second reading, um, and so you wouldn't be able to do that. But with everything else under the, the, this change, you would be able to do that. Some of the background is, I, I too, when, when Alderman Bellinger approached me about this, I thought, you can't do that. Um, but then doing some um, 
taking a look at it, talking to some other people around the state, it turns out there really is, other than those specific uh, matters, um, there isn't a provision that requires us to do it that way. Um, a lot of the changes here are, we wrote our ordinance sort of under the assumption that you would always have a first and a second reading. What it appears that many communities are doing is doing their first and second readings at the same meeting, um, which in essence really is hiding things from, uh, from the public uh, because they're not going to committees and that would not be a good practice most likely. So this at least gets you to the committee before it comes back to council. Um, the positive to that obviously is the time. The negative to that though is of course, you as aldermen are gonna have to make sure to be checking um, committee agendas if they're just in case there's an issue that might be of interest to you. I don't know how many of you do that all of the time, uh, but you would need to do that. The members of the public would need to do that to know when matters are gonna be uh, on a, a committee agenda, whereas now there's a little bit of forewarning by the fact that uh, it goes on the council uh, agenda uh, first. Um, in, in essence, you know, you just kind of have to weigh <coughs> whether that uh, is less important than, than the efficiency that you gain by not necessarily having to have everything at committee. And then what Alderman Bellinger was talking about is uh, most matters that would go to committee would likely get reported out at the very next meeting they're going to be on the council agenda. Uh, but because there is some provision in our ordinances for things like if a chairman decides to hold something in committee indefinitely and there are some provisions for taking things out of committee, for notice purposes, it would likely be a good practice for those matters that remain in committee, that get directly referred and remain in committee um, uh, to be noted at some, in some kind of a report on, you know, on a council agenda or uh, in, in some way. How that would exactly happen is not set forth in, in the ordinance, but um, it's something that we could work on with the city clerk. Thank you. All right, it's Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I talked to Alderman Bellinger about this earlier today, and I, I just got a couple things I have to clear up, and that would be the question I uh, posed to Alderman Bellinger was, for example, we have a council meeting coming up next Monday, a week from tonight, and if I had a document that I, a resolution that I wanted to do and refer to public works, Right now, I would send it to Sue Richards, and Sue Richards would put it on the agenda, and it would go to the Public Works Committee then on the next Tuesday. Uh, that procedure is still gonna is still gonna be maintained, correct? It would still be maintained unless you wanted it to go directly to Public Works. But now, it, it would be too late today, for example, if you had a document that wanted to go to Public Works there, tomorrow, it's, it's too late because you have to do it 72 hours in advance. Right. Um, so it would, then it would just get referred to council just like it al already happens. Um, so not every matter is gonna, going to get directly referred. So in other words, what you're saying then, uh, somebody could, uh, an alderman could uh, bring a document to the clerk's attention 72 hours before the public works committee and that, that could be on the agenda of public works without, there being, without, without it ever being on the council agenda. Right, under this ordinance, it could get put on the public works agenda without it ever having been on the council agenda first. You would need to do it at least 72 hours in advance. Uh, the other thing that, that you have an issue with, of course, is that then um, committee agendas, some committees get their agendas done more quickly than others, but you're probably gonna have to wait at least until that time to know whether a matter is gonna get put on the agenda. If, if you do the committee agenda a week in advance, um, 72 hours isn't gonna get it on the agenda and then it doesn't help. Lots of lights. Alderman Bitters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I've seen this firsthand, re referring documents through the clerk's office, uh, figuring it, it doesn't have money involved, it doesn't have uh, any of the larger, heady issues, but it ends up going through uh, Common Council. It's on our consent agenda that maybe anybody looked at it, probably not. And then another week passes before it makes it to our, uh, in this case, Public Works Committee. I am totally in favor of, it, as long as there's that set of rules about, uh, did it cost money, does it require an ordinance, 
giving the city clerk the latitude to send these documents where they're appropriate without that extra step uh, uh, that just drags the timeline out. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to ask Attorney Adams, um, you know, many times, you know, the committee chairman check and see what's going to be on their agenda and they have some control. Does this remove some of that control from the chairman of that committee? It does not. So this requires that uh, the matter get directly referred to the committee, but the fact that it's now referred to the committee doesn't mean that the chair has to put it on the agenda, just, and, as, just as is the case if something gets referred from council to the committee, the chairman doesn't have to put it on the agenda. They usually do, but they don't have to. Okay, thanks for that clarification. So. Alderman Bellinger. Nope. Okay, your light was slashed. Alderman Boren. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. I had a, a follow-up that I forgot before, and that had to do with something you said, Alderman Bellinger, about uh, a reporting system of documents that were going to be direct referrals. Uh, would that... Uh, and there would have to be notification of that, would that come in the form of, of uh, in a, as an addendum to the council uh, agenda that Sue would do that on the, you know, like we have other, right now we have, you know, other things required by law. Would there be an addendum on the c council agenda for things that didn't, ap that didn't appear on the agenda but are going to be direct referrals? So we have a way of knowing what the direct referrals are so for example, if there would be something that would be, would be going to finance that I would want to sit in on, that I would have a reasonable way of finding out before the finance meeting uh, and, the, and the agenda came out, that, uh, that indeed I would have a way of accessing that. What, are, what, what, what did you envision as far as that notice of, from the clerk? Um. I, I have not spoken with Sue. She was out today. Uh, I did speak with Attorney Adams earlier today, and it was, we discussed this, and it was suggested that there would be some type of report that the clerk could generate. Uh, what that looks like and, and how that's disseminated, we didn't get into. I, I would think that it would be you know, something that... Um, would be electronic that would go out to the alderman, something that would be on the website for the public to access, you know, you know, at that 72 hour point or whatever point in time during the week that, you know, here's what's going to, you know, the different committees or, or here's what's been referred to um, the various committees at that point in the week. Um, you know, so uh, I haven't worked out the minutia with, with Sue uh, but that, that's what we're envisioning, and you can correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. What we, what we talked about, I, I guess directly on point to your question, what, what we kind of talked about is that every council agenda, there would at least be a listing of items in, in some way. So if something got directly referred, let's say, to Public Works, the next council agenda would show that item, either naturally because it's come out of Public <coughs> Works, or because it got held in public works, didn't get acted on, it, it would get listed there. But there, there's nothing in the or, in ordinance that would say that prior to a meeting to which something would be directly referred, that there would be some kind of notice to everybody. The, the primary way to do that would still be via um, looking at the agendas. Um, it's sort of the way that happens with non-document matters right, right now. Some committees will occasionally put matters on their agenda that aren't documents just for discussion. Um, but now this allows this to happen also for, dis for documents. And this d it doesn't and cannot affect the 24-hour rule for open meetings. I mean, right. agendas still have to be posted 24 agendas hours. Agendas still have to be posted 24 hours in advance. So it, ca it, it, you know, it creates a small area for creating the agenda from the earliest you could do it to the latest you could do it. If I could just follow up, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, so it probably, Sue Richards could do another, right now we get, she sends out things that says minutes is an, it's minutes an agenda. Uh, I don't think it would be too much, I don't think it would be too difficult for her to send out uh, another email to the older persons or everybody on her, on her list 
that this item is being directly referred. Uh, I think that would be another way of, for the older persons and the citizens to know what the direct referrals are with as much notice as possible. Would that be, would that be something we could possibly request of the clerk if this passes that just like she sends out agendas and minutes that she sends out another heading, uh, these are the ones, these are the direct referrals. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alderman Mellinger, but I'd say a council meeting happens on Monday like they normally do, and um, during that Tuesday and Friday period, if somebody wants to throw something on an agenda for the next week, that would probably <coughs> allow Sue time on maybe every Friday to post, because there, there aren't any meetings on Wednesday, so let's say on Fridays, um, Sue Richards just sends out an email saying exactly what you're doing. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Sue may not like it because it's more work, but... Um, in the end, it's a little bit more efficient for us to operate. Would you agree, Alderman Ballinger? Uh, I would agree. Certainly, I don't want to speak for Sue. Um, and I'm not trying and, to. And, uh, you know, and I would like to, you know, talk with her, bef you know, before we enact something like this. But that would be my intent. And, um, you know, I don't think it would be a problem to, to do that. But, you know, confer with her first. Absolutely. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think um, one of the things um, when we do the agendas, it could be very easily noted on the agenda item, whether it's you know 2.1 that <coughs> in bold letters that this was a direct referral, and it would save having to send out a whole another email um, listing all the direct referrals. Presumably, most of us are looking through at least cursory um, the agendas, anyways, to see what's uh, what's on there. Um, so, if she just indicated that this particular referral was a direct referral. Um, you know, everybody would be able to see that. So I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is this will, part of the reason this came up, um, you know, Alderman Bellinger and I have long passed and uh, others have had conversations about things pop up at the last minute. We're either having special council meetings or we're suspending the rules or we're doing things, whether it's especially around permitting and, and things like that, where if, if we want to be more responsive to the general public, something like this will help us be able to do that. So. Again, this shouldn't be necessarily the norm either. Um, this is just gives us another tool to be able to get things in and help our constituents out a little bit faster. So thank you. All right, Alderman Heidman. No, he answered my question. All right. Um, again, I, I was more concerned with, uh, or wanted a, uh, an example of where the, the process we have now is flawed, other than the fact that when something pops up that we can get it into a committee without it having to go to the council first. I understand that portion. But I, I guess having been here as long as I have, I haven't seen where something that was so slow that we didn't get something done on our the normal way we do it. It's posted on the agenda. You, all the aldermen can read the agenda. We know where our items are going to be going to. And uh, I guess I just would like to get an example other than the fact that something just popped up. I'll down here, I apologize. That's okay, thank you. Um, I uh, am in full support of, um, of this proposed uh, change. Um, and we have a really clunky, in so many ways, we have a kind of clunky procedural processes, and I think that this is a, a good way to start addressing that. Um, the, I, I've, I've had constituents, particularly in, uh, in public protection and safety, when we're talking about parking issues, they're just dumbfounded that it's gonna be four to six weeks for anything to get done because you know something needs to come to council and then be referred and then come back to council and perhaps be referred again and, and so forth. So I think, and frankly, if this doesn't work, if it causes too much work or too much confusion, we can just go back to the old way. But I think this just brings us again more in line with 21st century processes of trying to move things forward in an efficient uh, manner. Absolutely, and just to clarify, I saw some confused looks on the floor as she was speaking. And being the chairman of public safety, I definitely experienced it all this time. So if there's a communication from a constituent in regards to a parking change, they submit it like the normal process. So it goes through the or the council, comes back to committee. And then when that communication is, is at the committee level, if we act on it, we have to send it back to council. All right, we have to actually, usually it's Ryan and the engineer's office has to draft an ordinance then send it back to council, then send it back to committee, then we send it back to council, and that's why it's four to six weeks. Just to do a simple thing such as taking one sign off a street, and as Alden Bellinger said, sometimes we move at a glacier pace and sometimes it's not good. All right, any other? I don't, are Alderman Bitters? Yeah, just a, a, a small comment. Uh, pertaining to uh, whether it, the 
city clerk should send out emails or a, given if we have the rules in place a, a, by state statute you got to have a second reading for ordinances you have to have a second reading for uh, taxes and levies given that it's probably sufficient to include that notification as part of the consent agenda at a council meeting it, there's nothing to say that if oh there was a direct referral that we couldn't object to it and say no we're going to pull that back to an actual council meeting you know but as long as those rules are in place i i don't see adding to the clerk's office that that adds a whole lot of value especially if we get carpet bond with individual emails about well this was direct referred and that was direct referred is probably sufficient to to include in the consent agenda thank you all right thank you um alderman born but just before i um, open it up again unless there's anything pressing i, I think we've covered it pretty well I, I don't see too much opposition to it so unless someone's got really earth something earth shattering I think we're gonna after Alderman Bourne I think we may take a vote on this so Alderman there's Bourne no motion. thanks Mr. Chairman oh, there is yeah there yeah there, there's a motion yeah. thanks Mr. Chairman I'm gonna I'm gonna support this tonight but I would ask Alderman Bellinger between now and Monday night's council meeting I'm sure there might be more questions of, of Sue when she's here on Monday night if you could uh, ask her how she would like to handle these direct referrals as far as notification to the council and so she's not blindsided so she so she can answer that question Monday night if you'd be willing to do that I tried to get a hold of her today with some questions but she wasn't available but if you could do that I would appreciate it absolutely I will take care of that thank you and it turns out I'm imagining things we do not have a motion on the floor thank you thank you <laughs> I should always know that Marilyn Donahue was always right and substantially older <laughs> <laughs> Second that. <laughs> <laughs> the motion from the dinosaur in the bag. I was going to say from the dinosaur. <laughs> so, so with that being said, I'd entertain a motion. <laughs> Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? All right. Would you like a roll call? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Last but not least, 3.3 RC number 143-15-16 by Finance, um, General Ordinance 17-15-16 by Alderperson Thiel, amending Section 118-91 and Section 188-94 of the City of Sheboygan Municipal Code relating to the City Motor Vehicle Registration Fee and recommends referral to the Committee of the Whole. Alderman Thiel. Did you have something? Yes. Should we start with that? Do you, do you have any comments before we... Start. No, let's let him do his thing first and then I'll... All right, thank you. At this point, we're going to open the floor to Director Beeble and City Administrator Amodio for a presentation. Nancy's handing out basically the presentation, which will also be on the screen, but sometimes it's easier to follow along with hard copies. And uh, I have to compliment Nancy on the creative title of the presentation this evening. <laughs> City Streets. Marge Mattern thought the bar was still in open. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a two-prong approach on this. I'm, I'm going to give basically <coughs> a background of the state of our city streets, where we're at currently with our inventory, um, the importance of maintaining this critical asset in our community, and then the next phase will be with Jim and talking about funding alternatives and looking towards how we're going to do that in the future. 
So the first slide that you see, and I think you've seen this in, in other presentations that I've made, basically is a, a graph showing your pavement condition on the left, 10 being very good, one being poor, and the bottom going horizontally out is time. And over time, your pavement will begin to deteriorate or fail. The top section between the 10 rating and a 6 rating is your excellent to fair, good performing pavement, I would say. What happens is over time is you get to a point of around 10 to 12 years, even to 16 years of life expectancy, where regular, ongoing, general maintenance is effective. It, it basically extends the life of your pavements. What occurs, however, if you miss that point where you're not doing your routine maintenance is it dips below and your pavements will deteriorate at a quicker pace, therefore more expensive to repair. Somewhere, anywhere from three to four times more expensive. So that just giving you a perspective of that philosophy of what we try to do. So you go out and you do your crack filling, your pothole patching maybe some, some seal coating, those types of activities, though um, don't appear to be um, big ticket items are, are doing a lot of um, good that is visual, let's put it that way. However, it is a tremendous um, program in terms of extending our life and doing it at a cost-effective manner as well. The next slide. We're going to get into our pavement ratings of where we're at currently. As of 2013, we, were, we will be finishing up our pavement ratings that are due by the end of the year for the 2015 and 2016 reporting year. But what you'll see in this chart is our, our failed pavements are rated 1, again, excellent, a 10. And what you see is that Fair are, are basically failed and poor, which would be ratings one, two, and threes. It's really only about 6.6%, uh, almost 7% of our network is in that category. The, by far the largest amount is in the fair category, which is the four, five, and six range. <coughs> That's at 51% of our network is in that area. They're performing but yet they're almost, they're, in a lot of cases, they're beyond the routine general maintenance where you can continue to extend the life. They're going to need on a more expensive repair. Good pavements and excellent pavements, we, we have fairly good high percentage of our network. 23, almost 24% is in good condition, and excellent is another 18%. So when you look at it, and then the next chart shows it graphically, you'll see the peak is at 5 and if you go to the right of five, the six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, we actually have more of our pavements performing fairly well in our community. Unfortunately, though, again, time is a factor in this. And when you have almost 45 miles of streets rated a five, if you would draw an arrow from that point and go to the left, that's what time's going to, time's going to shift that peak to the four area, to the three and two. And it gets very, very expensive, as you will see as we continue this discussion this evening, of trying to keep that category five and above. So how do we do that? We, we, we have quite a bit of different methods and construction methods, but... As I mentioned, time, let's, the next slide shows you just a quick comparison. We've been doing these pavement ratings that we report to the state since 2007. So if you look at 2007's ratings, in 2007, our excellent streets were almost 20%. Good was 31%. Fair was at 44.3%, and failed was at 4.6%. Fast forward to 2013. Excellent went down. 
Now we only have 18.2%. Good went down. We only have 23.8%. Excuse me. Fair. What has happened is the good and excellent have now shifted to downward into the fair. And so now we have 51% of our streets in the fair category. And failed has actually increased 6.6% in our community. So time, obviously, is affecting the condition of our roads. We can, and even currently, as you'll see, even with our current maintenance program, it's not enough to (coughs) even take care of the good and excellent condition to extend the life. So the next slide, please. We have multiple different types of repairs that we can perform and maintain on our network, and they all have a cost associated with them. So what we did is... We took, basically, tried to get this real basic. You take the center line of the street and you you measure up the length. And when you take every street in our city, we're roughly 200 miles of streets, just going right down the center, measuring it from one end to the next. So what we've done is we've taken our repair costs and converted them. Typically, we'll use square yards of pavement and square feet of pavement and, and things. What we've done for comparison and for visualization is we just said, what does a foot of street cost for this type of repair? So many of our streets are asphalt, asphalt over concrete or just plain asphalt. So a a typical repair on an asphalt street when it's down in the four, even a five, three, two, one category would be to mill off the old asphalt, basically grind it up, haul it away, and bring in new asphalt. The cost to perform that is $65.50 per foot. Um, What you're looking at is just to mill and fill our streets under the 2013 rating that would fall into this category, it's roughly $10 million. The next category would be the hot in place. And we did that some of this year. And hot in place can be used Insert on certain streets, it can't be used on concrete streets because we don't have, can't um, melt the concrete and replace it that way. So, and, and, and you need a certain condition. The road cannot be at a three or below for hot in place because the road is just too far gone. It would take far too much asphalt to be replaced to do that work. Nevertheless, we still have quite a bit that fall into this category, and those roads that could be performed under a hot-in-place method of, of repair. It's at $31, so it's, it's, it's a good alternative. It's half the cost of mill and fill, albeit it, it doesn't last as long, but it's cost-effective nonetheless. But the hot-in-place program for our city network, as of 2013, is about $10.8 million to do all those roads that are eligible for hot-in-place um, re- repairs. Next would be concrete reconstruction. This basically is your one, number one streets that are completely failed and shot. And what we would do is we would basically do what, like what hap- what's happening on Penn Avenue right now. Now, Penn Avenue wasn't completely shot. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of underground utilities. We had a new water main, we had new sanitary, and we had new storm. And, and in order to do that, we had to perform a complete reconstruct, basically take off the old pavement, replace all those utilities underground, and now we're going to put brand new pavement in. Very expensive. $225 a foot to do reconstruction. That's for those streets in the city of Sheboygan, that's $5.5 million worth of work right there currently at, at, in those, at that category. The other is new asphalt over concrete. We have a lot of concrete in our community. Concrete's great because it lasts a long time. It's cost effective, and it's our primary choice when we build new roads or reconstruct because typically we've gotten 40 to 50 year life expectancy out of our concrete streets. Nevertheless, a lot of our network is concrete. It's eligible for what we would do as a, a, a repair, is doing a concrete, or excuse me, an asphalt overlay of the existing concrete. Um, as I mentioned, we have quite a mi- bit of miles of that. That, that repair cost is at $52.50 a foot. 
And when we put that figure on what is eligible on our city street network for that type of repair, it would be $18.3 million to do the overlays of concrete in order to bring those streets up to, up to where they need to be. As I mentioned earlier in the earlier slide, we're, those streets that are in the 10 category, the 9, and, and even 8 at some, in some cases, general maintenance can extend the life of those streets and keep them in that category without the need to do some of these higher expense repairs. One would be such as an asphalt um, road <coughs> seal. That costs around $6.20 a foot. If we can get ahead of the game and get those streets such as an Erie Avenue that was recently paved three years ago or a Superior Avenue, which is four to five years, we get in there, we do crack filling, we do road sealing, and do that on a three-year cycle that continues to extend the life of that street at $6.20 a foot versus getting into the $31 where you have to come in and hot and, hot and place it. Crack filling again, another, another strategy that we use is $5.50 a foot. So just looking at asphalt road seal and crack filling, you're looking at around uh, $2.5 million right in the, in for those, those two categories. So when we add up all of these different types of road repair and maintenance strategies for our entire network and what type of strategy we would, we would deploy on the pavement type as well as its condition, the bottom line is it's $47 million. And, and that includes, as you see in this, this chart, is that, that includes you know, curb and gutter replacement, which in, in a lot of cases, if, you, if you're familiar with our streets, a lot of it's non-existent. It's broken away, it's crumbled, it's failed, and that causes drainage problems on our street. And poor drainage also then leads to poor pavements because the water isn't getting off our streets, it's penetrating our pavements, it's causing freeze-thaw cycles where we're getting potholes and, and premature fa <coughs> failures. All of this is based on 2015 prices. So if we go to the next chart in your, in your packet, you see that from this program's laid out from 2017 through 2015. And it breaks down the individual types of repair, mill and fill, hot and place, concrete road reconstruction, new asphalt over, over concrete, asphalt road sealing, and crack filling. Basically what we've tried to do here is lay out what the annual outlay would be on, on a program to start moving forward to protect our pavements and get them <coughs> repaired and get them in serviceable condition for our community. So it basically takes that $47 million price take, spreads it out over the years through 2025. Any questions regarding the state of the roads and condition and some of the pavement strategies or reconstruction strategies that we've laid in front of you at this point. If not, I'm going to turn it over to Jim to start talking about the, the next, next, next portion of this is the financing of this. I just wanted to know what the, what the term hot in place means. Well, I, I didn't catch okay. it. Th that, that's a, a, a system we used this year where it was a, a piece of equipment that basically heats up the existing asphalt in place, heats it up, another machine will come back and, and scarify and, and scrape up about the two, two and a half inches of the top, and then it relays it, and then we resurface it and roll it and compact it again. So it, it basically is resurfacing the existing asphalt, and it keeps it in place and recycles it in place. So you're not removing it. You're not bringing new stuff in. It's basically reconditioning and reusing the existing asphalt. Um, it's, it's less expensive, and... Um, it doesn't take as nearly as much labor as, as the other, other process. Okay. But it can't be used on every asphalt street. There's some streets that are just too far gone, and they still will need the older, traditional mill and fill method. Okay. I'll start on page 8, tax levy. Um, our current levy, levy is $21.7 million. 
dollars. You can see the general fund is <coughs> almost 16 million. The library fund is 2.3. Our debt service fund is 2,886, and we fund transit at 511 thousand dollars a year. The rate per thousand currently uh, based on two, 215 is 953 or an average home uh, in the city of Sheboygan is roughly hundred thousand dollars so it would be nine hundred and fifty three dollars per hundred thousand dollars of taxes paid by residents in the city. On page nine uh, we, we talk again from time to time about the impact of uh, our net new construction and we've looked forward on this and we saw a couple things. We see the revenue coming in in 16, 17, <coughs> and 18 from that net new construction, but we also have issues on the revenue side in the general fund. As you know, the garbage fee sunsets in 2016. That's worth $1.2 million. And our new construction permits, uh, based on the flurry of activity we've seen, will probably be reduced by roughly $400,000 for that activity uh, starting probably in 2017 forward. The revenue increases this year, we saw about $750,000 um, in our levy increase from net new construction. Uh, in 2017, we're looking at roughly 170, and where it really impacts us is in 2018, where we'll see roughly 800,000. That totals about a million seven, but you can see it's offset by $1.6 million in revenue decrease for losing uh, some construction permits and uh, the garbage fee sunsetting. So if we thought there was any upside that we could use, you can see where the upside is going to go to some of the funding sources on the revenue downside. Got a question. We'll wait till the end. Okay. <coughs> uh, the next slide on page 10 shows our current debt schedule. And this goes from 2016 through 2025. And again, the point I want to make is the road construction of $47 million doesn't end in 2025. It continues on in another cycle. Uh, for example, if we did hot in place, we could probably do it one time, last for seven years, and at the end of the seven-year cycle, we'd probably have to do a mill and fill on that road, which takes it to 65. So this is just looking forward nine years. It continues on for <coughs> every year in the foreseeable future with city roads. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you can see our debt service in 2016, it's $4.5 million. It's principal and interest. Our levy that I just covered is 2.8. So we have a shortfall of about $1.6 million. And where does that come from? It comes from other revenue sources. Currently, tourism funds that uh, because uh, we have uh, the tourism that we get from Blue Harbor for the convention center. That sunsets in 18. We also have the pension liability that the general fund pays the expense for the debt service uh, for the pension liability that was back in 2007 to fund that current. And we also have special assessments, which in 2016 we plan to use roughly half a million dollars of special assessment reserve funds to help fund uh, the debt service fund. But you can see most of that goes away, and by 2020 we have a problem in debt service of roughly 427000 and in 21, it grows to 1.1 million, goes up to 1.5, and then back down to 1.2. This schedule for debt assumes that we can borrow currently the $3 million a year that we borrow today. Two million for general fund um, projects and capital, and a million for motor vehicle fund. We also base this on a roughly a 3% interest rate. You know, last time we borrowed was around 1.8, but in the foreseeable future, interest rates are going to climb, so we use 3%. This tax levy uh, in 2021 will have to be assessed, and it'll be a roughly a 62 cent increase in the rate, or $62 per $100,000 on home value. So I don't see any way of getting around this. So in 2020 and 21, we're going to have to take some action to put debt service into the levy and have it paid for through taxes. If we look at funding sources, you saw the $47 million. And if we look at $2 million a year over nine years, that'll fund roughly $18 million. You can see $3 million funds 27, $4 million funds 36, and closest to the right number is $5 million a year in funding sources to pay for the roads that we have. 
On slide 12, this is looking at levy impacts in the 10th year because as we go out and borrow $2 million a year, it compounds till the 10th year and then flatlines. So it says if we borrow $2 million a year in 2025, it will gradually flatten out at $2.3 million in a levy increase that we would have to pass on to our taxpayers to make that investment. At $3 million, it takes the levy up in 2025 by $3.5 million. At $4 million, $4.6. And at $5 million, $5.8. And if you recall, our current levy is at $21.7 <coughs> $21 .7 $21 Again, borrowing at 3% interest over 10 years. And annual borrowing for regular projects is still at $3 million. So this would be in addition to the current $3 million that we currently uh, borrow for debt service. If you look at impacts um, in the tax rate, $2 million would raise the rate in 2025 to $10.56 from $9.53, or out in 2025, each taxpayer on a $100,000 value home would cost them another $103 for that. At $3 million, it raises it to $155, at $4 million to $206, and at $5 million, it takes the rate to $12.10 uh, for a homeowner impact of $257. Slide 14. If we look at funding source alternatives, um, we've talked about a wheel tax. Uh, that's the proposal. Uh, that would impact uh, a resident by $20. We have a garbage fee that sunsets that potentially could be used for roads at $60. If we borrow $2 million, um, that would cost the taxpayer $103. And currently using roughly $700,000 of capital that gets allocated out of the $2 million that we have each year, there would be no additional cost because that's in our current borrowing rate. <coughs> so it says that would be an impact to citizens of $183 um, on a $100,000 home, and it would come close to funding the $47 million. It would be about $6 million short. If you look at 15, this pretty much sums up where we're at, and it takes the status quo, which is currently funding $700,000 a year in our current roads, and whatever Dave has in his operational fund of roughly $300,000, for all of his material needs to use some for crack filling, it would take us 67 years to fix these roads. So just imagine how everything would move forward into the I can't drive on the road category. If we borrowed $2 million a year, it would take 23 years. If we borrowed $3 million, 15, $4 million, 12, and if we borrowed $5 million or used the alternative with some borrowing and some fees, it would take nine years roughly in both of those cases. And this graph just starts out, as I said, like if you look at the blue line, the blue line represents $5 million. It starts out at $28 increase per $100,000 of home in 2017, and gradually over time climbs to 315. <clears throat> These numbers also include the $62 per 100000 that we would need for the levy in 2021 to fund that debt. So you can see the lowest cost is status quo, two million, three million, the alternative then four and five million. Um, any questions on this, I'd be happy to answer it. All right, Alderman Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a couple of them, Jim. Sure. I gotta find my marked pages here. Uh, Going back to page 10 on the uh, debt schedule, I think that was my first one. Uh, well, I'll take that one first. Uh, what, if the what if the tax levy com continues to be frozen? I don't know how we can borrow any more money. Well, that's I mean, we said that our current debt level should be at around 24 million. We're currently at 32 and will grow about a million a year just borrowing $3 million. Okay. So it says we'd have to stop borrowing completely. 
and how would our, how would our ability how would our ability just to levy the property taxes that we're that we're doing now because at least through this biennium the state says we can't the only thing we can raise the general tax levy on is through growth what if that continues we can on? also raise it through debt and debt and debt okay. we can pass whatever we borrow we can pass on as a tax increase okay i think i have after one 2005 more. uh and then on page 14 you have the 60 dollar garbage fee as using as using the garbage fee towards a funding source so if you use the garbage fee that we're currently connected assuming that it would be re-upped re uh, if we use the garbage fee for streets then what else is going to suffer if we use that 1.2 million dollars for streets because we're using it for something currently it's just in the general <coughs> fund. where is it being used now oh, we're using it to fund the general fund okay and I'm saying by 2018 we'd have enough to cover the garbage fee with net new construction. Okay. So in 2018, you could take that, but you'd have to extend it because it sunsets at the end of 16. Mm -hmm. You'd have to extend it to 17 to help bridge the shortfall in the general fund budget. Okay. And then in 18, with roughly $80 million of net new construction, you could probably move that to roads. And quite frankly, we start roads here in 17, but if we ever did put a wheel tax in, Depending on the timing, we wouldn't see a lot of that benefit in 17 or in 16. So more than likely, 18 would be a good starting year, but we could start some in 17. The other issue we have on the timing of these roads, in spending five, six, seven million dollars on roads, we're doing a lot of miles of roads, whether it's mill and fill, hot in place, or reconstruct. And you know how many roads that would shut down in the summer because you know our window to do all of this is very short. So we have to be cognizant of that as well. <clears throat> and quite frankly, we really took a crack at laying the dollars over time, but haven't really looked at if we could complete all of it in that time. My final one is on page 9 under general fund revenue, uh, you have the garbage fee sunsetting. I didn't quite understand what you meant by new construction permits, that that would be going down by $400,000. I don't, I don't understand where that number We're comes currently from. generating about $400,000 more in revenue over the last two years and permitting fees because of acuity <coughs> and the other things we've got right. going on. And I'm saying by 2017, that construction's gonna go away. Um, we've got a $30 million construction project on the 11 acres we bought on the other side of the highway that'll be completed by then. We've got two <clears throat> developments for uh, housing downtown that will be completed by then. And right now on the pipeline in the foreseeable future, don't see any big pro other big projects okay, coming, you. so it says, you know, our revenue is going to be down on permitting. I got you. Okay. Question: This this data is based on the 2013 street condition, correct? Yeah, we're currently doing a survey now so for 15. Is it safe to say that the numbers will increase since two years have passed and road conditions may have degraded even further? We haven't Dutch done much maintenance, so the answer would be yes. So it, it's probably worse than it is. So. Correct. All right. Questions from the floor? There's got to be some. At least one. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, isn't the $47 million an unrealistically low number because it doesn't include any utilities, any sewer, storm sewer? Um, you know, you look at North Avenue right now, you, you didn't want to finish the complete overlay of that until the water main was fixed. Um, I mean, so there's, that number is going to grow, correct? True, true. By a tremendous amount, I would think. Wait. Yes. Water, water mains, they're funded through the water utility. Sanitary sewer <coughs> can be funded through the wastewater rates. The one that's, that's going to be the difficult one to quantify is the storm sewer. We did include the curb and gutter, but storm sewer, yes, that, that can at times um, on projects increase the cost. However, we have done a tremendous amount of storm sewer work and a lot of with the flood projects since 1998. So overall, I mean, our condition of our storm sewer network is in fairly good condition, but yes, 
the bottom line is yes, the number will, will need to go up for storm sewer to be included in, in these projects. Okay, and it, just one follow-up question. Absolutely. Um, I understand why you do concrete, you know, for the, the life of the road and, and some of the roads, obviously you have your traffic like Taylor Drive, that, that makes sense. Um, why is a road like North Avenue go from concrete to asphalt to concrete to asphalt? You know, I mean, would the, as, as you drive down it, it switches all the time. I'm just wondering if it's just the, the maintenance that was done, it was the cheap way to, is it, that it, the simple it, answer? It, a lot of it is maintenance. If, if It really is concrete from third all the way to Taylor. However, there's older sections that have been overlaid over the years and, and overlaid and, and different maintenance strategies. And, it, you know, the east side is much older than the section west where, let's say, on 25th Street or towards, towards Taylor Drive. So that still is concrete. However, if you've driven that section, it's pretty bumpy and there's a lot of potholes. And then it's probably due for an asphalt overlay. So, okay. yeah, it, it's, again, it's timing of it and the condition. Thanks. All right, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dave, does the $47 million take into account any, uh, any uh, cost shares between, uh, you know, on a road where, well, we're doing the, the 14th Street Bridge now, but let's say we had to continue going down uh, and repave that all the way up to Penn Avenue, for example. Now, wouldn't that be a cost share between the city and the state? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, the state <coughs> roads are not included in this inventory. Um, so this you, is only. So this would be no cost share. This would, yeah, this would mainly be the local roads that we we have. What, there there is some opportunities, but it's hit and miss. I mean, it's not an an ongoing where we're guaranteed money from the state. I think the the only program that we we know is an ongoing year to year is what's called the local road improvement program, and it's about a hundred thousand dollars that we get from the state for the local roads. For instance, we do have two, two local road projects that we're going to get some federal funding. Mm -hmm. North Avenue from 21st Street or, or, or Calumet Drive to 15th Street. We get, we're going to get about $3 million from the, the state and the feds on that project. And we're doing Superior Avenue from Taylor Drive to 29th Street. But again, those are once every five years we're eligible <coughs> to get some of this federal funding for our functional class roads, they're called, and there's some maps that we can, after, if you're interested, we can explain the functional class system. But yeah, um, these figures are mainly addressing what's under local control. Thank you. And it's based on 2015 numbers, doesn't take into account the rising cost of construction over the next 10 years. Correct. Alderman Donahue. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood um, the 47 million uh, proposed cost. I mean, we compare it to your street maintenance graph. This per, this assumes that we're doing things in a timely fashion. In other words, so the 47 million is not the. I, I know the figures would change, but it's you know two dollars of renovation will cost six to eight dollars if delayed here. I'm not saying there's a direct translation, but so it would be 47 million times some factor if we delay. Correct. Thank you. Alderman Thier. Thank you. I, I'd actually like to thank uh, Mr. Beeble and Amodio for putting this together for us today. I think it really gives a good idea to the, the general public out there on what the conditions of our roads are. Um, gives them an idea of how much dollars we're actually looking at and how important it is to have some type of plan um, in place and, and dollar-wise on how important a wheel tax does come into play into the, the whole big plan of, of, the, of the streets. Um, as far as the city of Sheboygan, we're doing so many good things. We're looking at all the things as far as bringing tourism in, how we're bringing in, um, you know, the, the businesses in the area, they're growing. Acuity, all these other areas. Um, they're looking at bringing in professionals into the area. If we don't take care of our streets and give them something to, you know, to come here for, I think we're defeating the purpose of all the other things we're doing. I think we really need to look at you know, the plan that they set forth and this wheel tax as part of the plan to make this work. Um, we got a great community here. It, it's funny, I, I actually went online to find the, the Reader's Digest thing. On, 
and, and I didn't believe I'd actually find it on eBay, but I found a copy of the Reader's Digest of the best place to raise a family. And you know, we're doing a lot of the things um, that we were great at back then. We're, we're getting back to that. And I think this is the streets are, are, are a big part of it. Um, one of the other things was a big highlight in here was um, companies growing, and I think we're doing that. Um, opportunities for kids was actually one of the big things also in that article, and I think we're really taking a good step on that also coming up soon um, with the help of um, Aurora and, and, and those projects that are going to be happening. Um, so with all those good things happening, if we don't care, take care of the streets, I think that defeats the purpose of everything we're doing. So thank you to you guys. I also want to thank Mr. Peters for was the only person who spoke tonight who were giving us some ideas. I think his ideas are, are, are valid. It just, I think that's a short-term thing. Um, I think we need to look at long-term like you guys laid out here. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. No. All, right. All right, well, I will take this chance to speak. <laughs> These numbers are staggering. I mean, we, we know that $47 million, and that's, that's probably fairly low in the grand scheme of things once we um, account for everything else that we can account for. Um, on principle um, alone, I, I, I've said that I, I was opposed to this wheel tax, um, mainly because it's a tax, and all the men, uh, or all the women, Donahue made a comment after our last meeting, at well, one of our meetings, um, kind of in response to that, and I, and I, I, I understand that. Um, <coughs> Thought about this for a long time. Um, obviously, I know the, the the situation that we were in. I've been around for I think this is my fifth year, and I've been fairly involved. Um, there's no way we're going to be able to cut our way um, to this. I mean, we've cut as much as we can. We've had a great staff, um, especially in the finance department, along with uh, uh, Director Amodio. Uh, we've cut as much as we can. And if anyone thinks that we can cut any anything more from our um, operating fund, it's, it's just kind of foolish in my opinion. And it's easy just to get up and spot out some ideas, but they, they're, they're generally just short-term or one-time savings. Um, sure, we can sell a piece of land, but that's, that's a one-time sale. Um, so we've, we've got to figure out a way to fix this. Um, we, we've heard a lot of good things tonight. Uh, well, not good. I mean, this, there's nothing about this that is good. Um, and like I said, on principle, I, I, kind of, I, I do disagree with this, but um, Obviously, there's no secret as to my political affiliation outside of these chambers. Um, there's no secret at all. And even one of my beloved presidents, Ronald Reagan, campaigned on lowering taxes, but he raised uh, taxes at least five times during his presidency. And one of them was the Highway Revenue Act of 1982, which was a gasoline tax, a user fee. And that's precisely what this wheel tax is. It's a user fee. The garbage fee is a user fee. People directly benefiting from the service are paying for it. Um, and like I said, I, I, I don't like it. I really don't. However, um, we can't cut our way to prosperity. We can't borrow our way to prosperity. Um, there is actually a funny quote I heard this morning and, and other things. I forgot who said it, but uh, um, in regards to the transportation um, issue at the state level, because this, this trans transcends the city and the, and the county. This is a state issue. This is a national issue. And one of the comments was, um, I, I don't care if we were building a stairway to heaven. I, um, I wouldn't borrow it. I wouldn't borrow the money. Um, I probably said it a little bit wrong, but you get the point. And the, the number to borrow, $5 million per year for nine years, I mean, that's just huge. We'd never be able to sustain that because, I mean, you should all know the more we borrow, the less money we have in our general uh, um, operating fund. And hopefully I'm not here um, when, when you have to reinstate the garbage fee, but I, I think it would be a poor choice not to. And... Um, Along with the garbage fee, the, the plan that was laid out between the wheel tax, the garbage fee, and the borrowing the small amount of money that we do bar, borrow right now, we'll be able to make a huge dent in this process. And, and I think it would be wrong of us not to do this. Um, because currently we're, we're kind of paying for the sins of our um, fathers that never, made, never kept up the road construction, that rated the money that was supposed to be there. And this is a common theme throughout all levels of government. It happened in the Doyle administration with the transportation fund. It happens everywhere. Um, the nice thing about this legislation or this ordinance right here, we cannot use this money for anything else unless something major happened at the state money at the state level. Because if we were use, use if we were to use this tax money or this user fee money for anything else, that would lower our um, the ability to spend. I forgot how to word it, but the, the levy. 
So truly this money could not be used for anything else. I know that's a common um, complaint against the last time the wheel tax was instituted in Sheboygan. It was used <coughs> for other reasons. But legally we would not be able to because we would just be shooting ourselves in the foot. It wouldn't help us. We wouldn't get along. Um, with that being said, I would um, move on to Alderman Hammond. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm really depressed. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. You when, need a hug? Uh, when we started looking at these numbers, what's that? I said, do you need a hug? Yeah, I do need a hug. Um, <coughs> we started looking at these numbers um, and having conversations with Jim and Dave. Um, you know, there's not a real positive alternative to a lot of this. You know, if we raise our debt, you know, we brought our debt now down from at 1.65 million to roughly 30. Um, any of these alternatives could take it back up as high as 55 million. Our debt level, our debt levy supports 24. You know, so the the creative options that are in here, the alternative, whatever whatever we want to call it, um, you know, may be the one way that we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, but not put ourselves back into you know such a high level of debt. Because my other concern is by getting our debt level up there, what does that do to our bond rating and our ability to bond at the uh, most favorable rates that we have and uh, have been over the last couple uh, couple uh, bond cycles. So, you know, there's not a, a great alternative. My challenge with the with the um, wheel tax, and I you know I get the whole um, you know levy reduction. Um, we've kind of lived and breathed that, but um, there was a group here during the motor vehicle fund when the motor vehicle fund was prosperous that used that to pull out for the pension. Um, issue. Now, I'm not sure how I voted if I was there at the time, um, but the point being is that fund is now almost default because it was rated. Um, so I want to make sure that if this wheel tax goes through and I get what's going on at the state level, but we all know that can change, that there needs to be something very concrete and solid inside of this ordinance that says a supermajority um, or some sort of um, supermajority has to approve before this money can be used for any other purpose other than that. Short of that, I'm not sure I can get behind that piece of it. Um, so I think one of the things um, we need to also look at is every opportunity to leverage different dollars. And I, I will tell you, um, Dave Bebo and, and Jim Amodio and Chad Pelotech do a wonderful job of taking dollars that we either get from CDBG or HUD or what have you in various different areas and trying to leverage all of that. We just need to continue to do that so we can make a dollar work for five. Um, but again, I think we also need to be very cognizant of, you know, yes, these provide solutions, but there's also a downside to this. Um, you know, it's not, unfortunately, a win-win here. Um, to get these roads fixed, there's going to be some pain, and that pain is going to be increased taxes to cover this debt levy that we're um, probably going to have to do um, to get out of this issue. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Alderman Boren, or Alderman Danihu, were you first? You can go first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, <clears throat> I, I certainly understand being chairman of Public Works for two or three years and being on the committee for probably five or six years, I'm certainly aware of the issue of the streets. However, we have other issues. We've got the thing that uh, Alderman Bellinger is working on with his committee, the Building Use Committee, for what we're going to do with City Hall, uh, what we're going to do with Number One Fire Station over here, uh, and also, you know, I got to play devil's advocate from the taxpayer standpoint. Uh, people in my age group just got the news that, uh, and I can probably afford it <coughs> myself, but Social Security is not going to be going up next year. Uh, people in my age group just got notification from their insurance companies for their Medicare supplements or their Advantage plans. Uh, if the premiums aren't going up, the maximum out-of-pocket is going up. Uh, you know, twenty dollars doesn't seem like a lot, of, like a lot of money, uh, but the people that are going to be paying the freight for the last seven years, the per capita income in this country has gone down. And that's and that's that's the working that's the working age people, uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, very easy to talk about slapping another twenty or another forty on top of the garbage fee if that's reinstated, plus the other fees that are on the water bill. It just keeps adding up and adding up, 
And for a good segment of our population, we're continuing to ask them to make sacrifices. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly from what Jim Amodio said last year about this time, salary and benefits for the city of Sheboygan, I believe, are going to be 81% of the budget. And I don't know uh, if we've been doing enough to try to whittle that down. Uh, one department, since I've been around here, when the last, when the last police chief retired, we saved about $450,000 a year by making deputy chiefs uh, uh, change their, their title from deputy chief to commanders, I believe it was. And we also uh, got some early retirement on people in the police department. As of January 1st, we're saving over $900,000 in city levy that it is going to cost us on the county side, but it is coming off the city levy. Uh, and also public works. If you look at the public works department, uh, Director Beeble is working with many, many fewer people than he was years ago. And also, we are hiring new employees now at about $17 an hour, which is good. Uh, it's, it's probably not a, a, a good living wage if people have families, but in comparison, I believe those people were starting at over $20 an hour. So this leads me to the... Uh, one department that I have constituents talking to me about and uh, whether some aldermen like it or not, I'm going to mention it again. And I understand that Chief Romos is working on a, maybe on a five-year plan for the fire department, but I, I don't see how we're going to be able to afford a million dollars of repairs and improvements to number one fire station. Uh, <clears throat> we have an opportunity with two or three distinguished members of the fire department retiring in 2015. We have another six retiring and distinguished members of the fire department retiring in 16. And, I, and Jim Amodio told me a couple weeks ago that he anticipates another five in 17. If we are ever going to make any uh, improvements or doing things better than we are in the fire department, when would we rather do it? When we have to potentially lay off the newest employees, or do it like many companies do in the private sector, when people retire, that's when you make changes. I would much rather, if, if we had to uh, come to this, is not rehire some of these people that are retiring and possibly go to four stations. I've had some aldermen tell me they, they think there should be a, one station on the north side and one on the south side. I think that's a little radical. But... If we're going to make any changes, I think this is a department uh, where there are a lot of dollars, and these aren't one-time dollars, these are in the tax levy that could be transferred to streets. So, you know, looking at, you know, playing devil's advocate and thinking of the taxpayers, I think that's a department we have to take a look at, and I'll be very interested to see if uh, Chief Ramos comes up with something that's not basically the status quo. When we have this many people retiring, in my opinion, this is the time to restructure that department and still maintain good public safety, and I think it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address a few things. Um, the crumbling of City Hall is not going to prevent people from moving to Sheboygan. Absolutely not. I would say 98% of citizens do not care where City Hall is actually placed. That is not a factor in quality of life here in Sheboygan. Roads are. The fire department, police department, public works, as with almost every other um, uh, branch of our city government, is important to quality of life. This right here is all about roads. This is going to help address the road issue. We're going to have to continue to make tweaks at every level in every department to help with the rising cost, with, with just, staying, just in, staying in line with inflation, salaries, <coughs> uh, benefits, they're all going to continue to in, increase. We're going to have to continue to make changes at every level. This does not address that. This is simply just for roads. And when the time comes, I, I'm sure the, a possible change of the fire department could be brought up, but we're not addressing that right now. That's not going to fix the road problem. It's not going to. It's a revenue problem. Like I said, a little bit before, we can cut as much as we would like. We're still not going to have enough money to fix the roads. 
We have a revenue problem. We do not have a spending problem, unlike the federal government. We're on the other side. We need to raise money, whether it's a tax, a user fee, whatever you want to call it, that's the issue that we're addressing here. That's one issue, the roads. And as we move forward, we're going to continue to look at health benefits. We're going to continue to look at uh, retiree benefits. There's a lot of things happening at the state level and at the federal government that are going to affect what we do. There's, there's less money coming in from the state. There's less, I mean, heck, I, mean, I don't even know how the federal government is operating right now. If you look at the numbers, it, it's, it's astounding. So we're going to, of course, we're going to have to con continually to make changes in every department when it comes to staffing. That 81% number that is always thrown out, we are in the service business. Every branch of government is in the service business. We do not produce a product. So, of course, our, salaries and our salary cost is going to be 80 to 90% because that's the business that we're in. We're short of cutting half uh, and the other half of our city departments, I mean, wh wh where else do you think our cost is going to come from? That's a frustrating part. The fire department. And I, I've been a staunch reporter, uh, a supporter of the fire department since day one. I always have and I always will be. They do a great job. They do a great job with the money. The ambulance service brings in money to the general fund, regardless of whether you want to admit it or not. It's, what, $700,000 last year, Mr. Modio? Granted, I know we're not talking about cutting the ambulance service, but okay, let's cut six firefighters. It's going to affect service as a whole. Let's just say we get rid of the ambulance service. There's a $700,000 hole we need to recoup. Once again, revenue problem, not a spending problem. This is step one of a larger picture that we need to address. Thank you. Alderman Dining. Okay. And I'm just going to re redirect us back just a, a little bit more practically. Thank you. Um, as Alderman Thiel said, I um, really appreciate this report. I. Uh, um, appreciate what uh, what Dave and, and Jim have done here. This is really, um, you know, I've looked at the other stuff that, that Dave has done, but this is just very informative. And that leads me to my second point, which is it's really pretty clear to me that uh, a wheel tax in this respect will be <clears throat> a positive revenue source. I, th I understand um, Alderman Hammond's concerns. I think Section 118-94 sub B um, really is fairly explicit language that indicates that all monies remitted to the city through the wheel tax shall be directed for the use, um, for the operation and maintenance of, of streets within the city. If we need something even more specific, I would certainly cheerfully support that, but... Um, I, Spoken by an attorney, 118 sub B. <laughs> well, no, I, it's, it's section two of the proposed... Uh, I know, I'm just... I'm okay. <laughs> um, but here's the deal. Um, I think this brings into sharp relief that we need to continue to look for other sources as well. So the wheel tax is helpful, but I think that looking on a broader scale of um, you know, what Mr. Peters was talking about, um, one of the things that you know, we may want to sit down and talk with other uh, government uh, bodies uh, uh, about is a potential for cooperation, a possibility. You know, what could we look at in terms of a sales tax for the county? How would that money get divided up in terms of money? I guess what I'm saying is, is that in addition to the wheel tax, we really should be looking at some other alternatives as well. And just redoubling the advocate here, what I would say is that, and I understand um, Alderman Bourne's concern for taxpayers, I have to say for $96 a month, if my house is worth $100,000 a year, I, I get a lot of service. It costs me less than the cell phone, but I get fire protection, I get police protection, I get some nice streets to drive on, some not so nice streets to drive <laughs> on. I have great parks, I have a world-class library, um, we even maintain a cemetery. For $96 a month, that really seems to me to be a, a pretty good deal, but I think that we... <laughs> The reason that we're in this pickle is because we haven't been thinking of the taxpayers. We've been thinking about, let's kind of bury our heads. Average road repairs, according, if you'll remember when Todd Berry came in and spoke at the last committee of the whole meeting, average road repairs for an individual's car because of bad roads in the state of Wisconsin averages $793 a year. Now, for some of us it may be more, for some it may be less, but nonetheless, Bad roads really do cost a lot of money, and I think that this uh, wheel tax is, uh, is a good first step. Any questions?
question in terms of um, the, the resolution itself and I guess procedure. If we were to um, try to get some language in there in regards to um, the supermajority type of vote, how could we, could we address that in the same ordinance? You, you could amend the ordinance. Okay, and then just have that as a, like, because right now subsection C is based, uh, is based on the current state law, but trying to add in another provision saying if state law changes, it would require a, a supermajority to, to raid the funds, because that's what they would be doing. Well, yeah, I mean, s subsection C is there regardless of what the state law is. Okay. Um, it's the state law is an additional protection uh, okay. on top of it. So you would have to amend C, and the state law would have to change in order for, um, for you to raid the fund. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to have to rebut a couple things that you said. Uh, first of all, Jim Amodi is standing up here last year at this time. I asked him a question on ambulance revenues. He said that if he included the cost of the salary and benefits of all 21 paramedics, the, the, and that says nothing about any, even any management time, that the ambulance service would be losing money, okay? I'm assuming if, I'm assuming, and I'm not proposing it, but I'm assuming that if the ambulance service went away and through this reorganization, if it ever takes place, we get to lesser stations, we do not need the number of people in the fire department that we have right now. Because if we didn't have the ambulance service, we wouldn't need as many paramedics as we have right now. And if we go down to four or three stations, just like if we close station number one out here, that means that that no longer has to be staffed. So uh, it depends on how you look at the numbers of the ambulance service. But I'm just going by what Mr. Amodio said up here last year, that if all of the costs of all 21 paramedics were on the ambulance, were, were treated as an ambulance expense, rather than four, sure you can show $700,000 going to the general fund, but you're only charging four paramedics to the ambulance service. But I'm just going by what Mr. Amodio said last year. All expenses of the paramedics, salary and benefits, the ambulance service loses money. That's all I want to say. Mr. Amodio. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Alderman Thiel. <coughs> we need to keep it on the topic that's at hand is that the wheel tax. I think we kind of got a little carried away. Um, I just wanted to mention before I did propose the, the ordinance and even afterwards, um, I did talk to a lot of people as far as the $20. And their biggest concern was making sure that it went to the streets. Um, I feel that a lot of phone calls, obviously, after it happened, um, after it came out that, you know, my name's on the ordinance, um, fielded a lot of phone calls. And once you explain actually how the, the ordinance is set up that the money will go to the streets, they almost every one of them, except I think two, said, you know what, as long as it's going to the streets and not getting raided, I'm fully 100% in favor of it. But they're all worried about what happened last time that the fund got raided. So I just wanted to add that, that I did talk to a lot of people, and I, th I think it came down to two. I, I didn't bring the sheet that I had it written down because I kept everybody's name down. That said, they weren't in favor, of it, but all the other ones. Once you told them how it was set up, they're all in favor of it. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the floor, Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we had a great report tonight. Um, I thank our um, finance department, DPW, the administrator's office, and engineering for all the work they did on it. Um, one of the things that wasn't brought up tonight is that right now most of the things we tax is on our home and the value of your home. And this really takes it to, I think, a little bit true user fee. If we go with the, uh, the wheel tax, people are gonna pay for these road improvements based on how many cars they have and the cars that they drive on these roads rather than the value of your home. I think this is an extremely fair way to do it. And while it's not, the wheel tax isn't the you know, the only part of this, it's the equation there. It's the thing that we're considering right now and where we're making a change. 
So I think it's a very fair way to uh, assess uh, the roads and, and get this, this road rebuilding program started. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. I have one more question that maybe the mayor can help us out with this, being that he used to be in county government. Uh, first of all, are there any county wheel taxes around the state? And I guess if we did have a county-wide uh, wheel tax, I think we would end up with, what, 33% uh, of the proceeds of that tax? And would that be about the same amount that we're anticipating on getting if we do it ourselves? Mr. Mayor. If I can respond. Um, I'm not aware of any county wheel taxes personally, um, and I've never heard of a county that has a, a sales tax or any other tax where they're you know, giving part of the proceeds back to the local municipalities. Um, during the budget bill, there was a proposal that was circulated that, um, that counties could have a sales tax that they could implement. And then that would be divided up amongst all of the municipalities. And in the formula that they were talking about, they said that uh, in Sheboygan County it would raise about $9 million for a half percent sales tax. But then the county got half for their roads and the rest was split up amongst the other municipalities based on their road miles and the condition of the roads. And I think that formula would have netted the city of Sheboygan about maybe $2.2 million out of the $9 million. Every year? Every year, if they would have uh, done it. But that's the only proposal that was brought forth and uh, it didn't go anywhere in the, in the budget discussions. So I'm not real hopeful it's going to come back. It would take a lot of work, I think, to do that. And given the you know, position or the, the climate in the legislature, uh, I, I don't see them wanting to implement something that would allow for another sales tax over and above the existing 5% sales tax that's currently there. Before I move on, correct me if I'm wrong, but during your term as county board chairman, wasn't there an attempt to create a, a county-wide sales tax and it was killed? Yes. Yes. Um, and I, I don't think the makeup of the board has changed that much. I don't want to rely on something that may happen at the county level or something that may happen at the state level. It, DOT already came out and um, delayed a bunch of proje uh, projects that include um, projects within the city of Sheboygan. We need to take the approach, in my opinion, that we're on our own. And we need to raise the revenue on our own because we cannot sit and wait for a higher echelon of government to come and rescue us because it's not going to happen. Alderman Herman. Thank you. When I was taking a survey on uh, Friday amongst my constituents concerning the wheel tax, uh, one of my constituents brought up a very good point. He said that the taxpayers are already paying for street repairs that's already on the general tax rule, general tax uh, payment. He said he should not have to pay for the same service twice. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. I just wanted to make a quick point. If we, if there was a county wild wheel tax, um, you know, we still have the same amount of vehicles registered within the city of Sheboygan. So assuming it got broken up that way, you know, that we've got our share of the number of vehicles we have registered in the city, it'd pretty much be about the same effect other than someone else is collecting the money for us. So I don't know that there would be a whole lot of difference in income if the county instituted it um, versus, you know, us instituting it. So. I can tell you there's no appetite for anyone to create a new fee or new tax anywhere in government, but it's just kind of how it's happening right now. Alderman Bellinger. Nope. Your light was on. Sorry. <laughs> light bulb above your head. Comments from the floor. Questions from the floor. Someone like to propose an amendment to the document. She's trying to move things along here. <coughs> Wheeler. Is All right. there a motion on the floor? There is no motion on the floor. I have an amendment to him. Shh. Shh. Alderman Donahue. Um, I, move a, uh, I move approval of the proposed uh, ordinance uh, creating a, a wheel tax for the city of Sheboygan. Second. I have a motion and a second. 
under discussion. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. Um, although I understand from Attorney Adams that this is probably overkill, um, I would amend uh, or I'd like to make an amendment to add that um, any funds that are directed outside of this require a supermajority of the council um, to approve. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second to amend the document to require a supermajority to be able to um, take any money out, out of the fund for purposes other than road construction. Alderman Bellinger. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. So, Shea, you went out with the confusing ish. It still says Carlson okay. when you hit the button, so it hasn't been updated since, I, <laughs> since I've been there. So I, I don't, who, whoever Bellinger is now, that's why the light that's was still you. on. That's you. We just switched. That's Mike. Oh, yeah. Thanks for turning me off. <laughs> welcome. Um, my, my question is with, with Attorney Adams. Is the supermajority, is, is that the greatest majority? I mean, we couldn't do unanimous if we wanted to. Well, there's, there's two issues. First of all, the motion as you have proposed it actually is in conflict with the ordinance as you have it. Um, so we're saying you can't do it, but, in order to, but if you want to do it, you have to have a supermajority. So it, it's not consistent with the, with, with the ordinance. Now, if, if you were to say, to say, have a different amendment, that would say the repeal of 118.94c must be a by a supermajority. Um, you, you could conceivably do that. And that is the, the greatest? Under Robert's rules, can you do a? Can you do? You know, I, I, I would have to look that up, but um, I would suspect that requiring a unanimous vote would not be well looked at, but I don't know the answer for the, to that off the top of my head. I'd have to do a little bit of research. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. I would uh, redo my emotion um, using the language that Attorney Adams had so indicated. Second. Okay. Alderman Donahue. I, I, I'm just following what, what Attorney Adams is saying, and, and I think having a supermajority or any provision that allows the undoing of this amendment or of this of both B and C is actually counterproductive to protecting the fund. I mean, it says it can be used for only be used for street repairs, but a supermajority of us can change that. And so I think, I mean, the language in both B and C taken together is so directive as to say that's it. Um, that. I, I think adding a supermajority actually weakens the protection for the taxpayer. Even if the state law changes, so B is no longer in effect. Well, if you look at if you look at B and C together, um, and notwithstanding the provisions and so forth, I mean, I, and Attorney Adams can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if we are doing something that is well is less restrictive than the state statute, then um, we have some issues. Right. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to support the supermajority piece of it. I just think it weakens, I think it weakens the provision. The point of order didn't, weren't we just talking about uh, the amendment is upon repeal of 118, blah, 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 blah. Um, then it would require a supermajority. Any repeal of 118.94, Sub C um, would then require or B and C would then require a, a, a supermajority. Legally speaking, you can do that. I think practically speaking, Alderman Donnie, who has has raised a, a valid concern. Once again, the attorney strikes. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my and I thought about this when I was reading this over today. <clears throat> what would prevent? one of us from bringing in a resolution to, uh, for under number C to use those funds for something else. And if we didn't have the motion that Alderman Hammond is proposing, uh, what would prevent that from just being a simple majority? Well, our levy would be reduced under current state law. 
so there would be no benefit to taking money out of the fund as, as long as things are status quo right now. Okay, but then let's say, let's say the law changes. I guess that's what we're trying to address right now. My concern would be that somebody could bring in a resolution and just by simple majority without having the super majority there, that would be my concern. And I w when I read this this afternoon, that was what my concern was. So I guess I would, would want to stay with what Alderman Hammond was proposing and I originally seconded it and then it was updated and seconded by Alderman Bellinger, but I think I would personally feel more comfortable with that if there was a law change. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. Attorney Adams, how do we structure this so that we don't tell them in Donahue's point, we don't weaken the, the current, but put protections in that I'm hoping to have um, so that we don't have another motor vehicle fund type um, issue. Wait. You can do one or the other. Either way, you have some concerns and some protections. So you can add a, another subsection that requires C, any amendment to C to be by a supermajority, or you can leave well enough alone and, and leave it as is. Um, you have to make the policy decision as to whether one is weaker or one is stronger. Um, I, I think that all I can tell you is that Alderman um, Donnie, who's ra raised at least a valid concern for you to consider policy-wise. Legal-wise, if you choose that you want to have that, it can, it can be done. You can put in a supermajority in order to delete sub C. So as a matter, as a practical matter though, if the, if the amendment is upon repeal of whatever those statutes are. Um, so you would put something in that says, if the state statute is repealed then? Correct. It, 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 frankly, your better bet is if the state statute changes, then you come back and, and you, you make some changes to the ordinance. That's typically how we do things. If the state statute changes how we do things in the city, we change our city ordinance. Obviously, there's always the concern that some common council down the road won't want to do that and you want to prevent them from doing that. Um, but typically, uh, we take the law as it exists and we work with it and, uh, because we don't know what changes might come forward. But that's a policy decision. Legally, we could put the amendment in, and if the body came and said, two-thirds of the body says we want to spend the money, and if state law is currently in place, then that will reduce our levy. So there's no incentive to, to, to raid money from the fund. Right. Under the current, under under the the current, current law. law, you yes. have a sort of a double protection. Yes. So yeah. what, if the state law did go away. Then you'd only have the single protection of our ordinance and the and. Well, th that would be your second level yes. of protection then. Okay, and, the but if we don't put the two-thirds in, if the state law went away, there would be no protection of the fund. No, the protection would still be there. In fact... What would it be a simple majority? It would, it would be a simple majority to change the ordinance. You still, it would still not take a simple majority to raid the fund. Okay, because you, would, you would actually have to go through the process of changing our ordinance, then raid the fund. So it, it, there is still two steps to it. Okay, so there would be public scrutiny at that point. Correct. Okay. I thought somebody had their hand up back there. Oh, stretching? All right. So I get this, at this point, I mean, what route do we want to go? There's an amendment on the floor. There is an amendment on the floor. There's an amendment and a second. the amendment on the floor. Correct? No, yes. It's more of a friendly. Yeah, I, I guess, could we take that as a friendly? Okay. Do you, sure. Would you support that, Alderman Moore? Yes. Okay. So the amendment on the floor by Alderman Hammond and seconded by Alderman Bourne. All right, any other discussion on this? What's that? Flash Ballinger. Flash <laughs> Ballinger, yes. Um, if not, um, we'll take a roll call on this. Okay. Ballinger? Aye. Bitters? Aye. Bourne? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Damrell? Aye. Donahue? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Herman? Aye. Field. Aye. Can I? All right. The motion, the amendment does pass. So we have the general ordinance as amended. Any further discussion? All right. I'm not going to pause any longer. Um, let's take another roll, please. As amended. 
the general ordinance as amended. Okay. Bellinger? Aye. Bitters? Aye. Foreign? No. Carlson? Aye. Damro? Aye. Donahue? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heideman? No. Herman? Sorry. And Field? Aye. Eight ayes, two noes. All right, then. General ordinance does pass as amended. That being said, we don't have a next meeting date, so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.